I believe with all of my heart that God the Father is seeking to change our focus. Now listen to me clearly. Not our doctrine. I'm not talking about doctrine today. I don't believe that it's God's trying to change our doctrine. But I do believe that he is trying to awaken the body of Christ, to wake us up, and change our focus. When our focus changes, the doctrines that aren't workable pass away. They just kind of pass away. And when we understand where we should be focusing, the doctrine, the real doctrine, when things pass away, begin to work themselves to the surface. I recognize and I know how God speaks to us, and I, 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 I mean, I just know how he speaks to me, but we're living in a, a, a time where certain things are passing away. Tomorrow I'll be doing uh, the funeral of my aunt, who is my mother's last sibling. She was the baby. She's the last one. Uh, Dad's the only one. I'm kind of on his case right now because he fell last night in the shower, and then he fell this morning again. And 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 uh, I'm saying, Dad, you you got to you got to step up here. You're 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 what's there. But things. Listen to me. Say this. One generation passes, and then all of a sudden, another generation arises. Listen carefully to me. There are doctrines that in time and in our history and in certain times of our past played a key role in what God was saying to people in that generation. And then another generation comes and, and he speaks in a different way. And I recognize and I realize the way he speaks to a younger generation may not be the way he speaks to some of us that are here today, but I want to be in tune with God, what God is saying to a younger generation. Do you understand? I want him to be able to speak to our children and to us in a way that is, is very profitable, if I could say it that way. What I really want to do today and what I'm after is to try to get you to see the kingdom of God as the central focus. So many people focus on church. And I'm not downplaying church because church is vital. Christ is building a church. But the focus that we should have should be on the kingdom. Now I'm going to make a few statements to try to set the stage for what I want to say, but I want you to be attuned and listening or hearing what the Holy Spirit is wanting to say to us today. But we all are aware of the fact that God is agape, God is love. The Greek word for God's love is agape. There's other words for love that express the human love and um, uh, that kind of love, relational love. But God is love. He is agape. Matter of fact, God's DNA is agape. And his agape, his love, is an absolute love. I think we sometimes misunderstand God's love because we only can relate to the love that we think or that we feel or that we experience and what we know is love. And when we have known our love, we try to make God's love something that is ours and it's not. His love is... His love is absolute and our journey through this life in my opinion the, the the living of our life is for us to allow his love to mature in us most of you know that I've been called my calling as a pastor is to mature saints for saints to do the work of the ministry and the work of the ministry in my mind is that that the love of God being shared and being ministered to one another and I'll talk more about that in a moment but but, but I really believe with all of my heart that we need God's love, God's love, His agape, to mature in us. How many of you know there's times that you feel conviction because you know you don't love certain people like you should? Hmm? I mean, it's just something I deal with. Maybe I'm the only one. 
And you know, it's not bad to be human if we're human as God intended. God made man in his image and his likeness. He had something in mind for a human being. And I want to be human as God intended me to be human. I want to be what he wants us to be. Now, when we, when, we, when we begin to talk about the kingdom and we begin to put our focus on the kingdom is what I want to talk about today. We've got to understand something about the kingdom purpose. What's the purpose of the kingdom? And, and um, if we understand that our focus being on the kingdom of God, um, then, then we understand that it influences everything that comes after us. In other words, when we focus on what God's trying to do on the earth and his kingdom inside of us, his kingdom operating through us, um, we, we, we understand our purpose better. And when we understand, well, let me just say this, or with, without purpose, without purpose, it's impossible for us to understand our true identity. We don't know who we are if we don't know the purpose of us being here. And a lot of us have lost our purpose. We've lost the reason for being here. A lot of people in the world, you know, uh, uh, true identity, true identity is found in the kingdom of God. It's something that is in It's the righteousness, the peace, and the joy that's on the inside of us. But true identity is found in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is the real, the authentic way we're supposed to live. Jesus came and the message that he brought was the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the message Jesus preached. You know, I was telling the Lord this week a couple of times. I said, Lord, if you would send me your sermon notes, I'd throw away all my notes. I'd get rid of every book I have. I'd get rid of my whole library because I'd like to know what you preached. I would. I'd like to know. I'd like to have his notes. I think I could preach his notes the way they ought to be preached, don't you? Now listen carefully to me. What is life without purpose? What's a life about if a life doesn't have a purpose? Without purpose we become increasingly shakable. How many of you understand there's shaking corporately that's taking place, there's shakings that individuals take place, there's things that happen that's, that's, that puts us in a place. Um, and, and, and without purpose, we become increasingly shakable. In other words, everything disturbs us. Uh, we, we live in anxiety and fear. We don't really know who we are. We don't know where we're going. We don't know why we're going there. We don't know what we're doing. We're just living our life, existing every day for uh, uh, something else to happen or take place. And I see so many people who live their lives without purpose. But purpose is what gives us the experience of being useful, helpful, and valuable, useful, helpful, and valuable. I want to understand purpose. I want you to understand purpose. Listen to me, guys. We can't live our lives alone. One of the biggest problems that we've had for years in the body of Christ, and we still have this today, is too many people live their lives for themselves. They're not bad people, they're not mean people, they're not ugly people, they're not unsaved people, they're not evil in any way, but they live their lives totally and completely trying to satisfy and bring happiness to themselves. Now, I believe that we need to 
experience something of what it means to be useful. As Leanne was getting ready yesterday for vacation Bible school, she had sent out some letters, sent me a letter, and said that we're going to be working from 12 to 5 on Saturday, and I can use your help, and if you can, I want you to show up, and I got here, and I walked in, and I said, I'm here. What do you want me to do? She said, well, I'd like for you, the first thing I'd like for you to do is to take all of these flyers and go to the apartments next door and the apartments next door, and I'd like for you to hand out flyers to both of our neighbors on both sides. I don't know that anybody there knew I was the pastor over here. But I was trying to be useful. Now, when I came in and realized that I was going to have to do this, John, I love you. I'm so glad you were there to show me what to do. But I may take that home. That's a great prize. Do y'all know what this is? A what? Yeah. Can y'all do those? I'm, I just want to tell you on that, I don't believe this one can be put in right order. So, okay. But anyway, listen to me. What do we have to do to begin to recognize and see ourselves and to understand that we have personal value? That we are useful that we are helpful. Listen carefully. If we're going to have personal value, we're going to have to begin to see our lives as being pleasing to God the Father. God, what do you want me to do with my life? What can I do that pleases you. We've got to learn how to live for and how to serve somebody other than ourselves. You remember there used to be a song, you're going to serve somebody. You remember that song? You know, I, I want to please God. Do you, do you all want to please God? I want to please God. I want God to be happy. So when I think about focusing on the kingdom of God, focusing on the purpose of God, I think I have to understand something about what is the purpose of the kingdom of God and what is God's governing purpose. Now, I believe the governing purpose of God is the kingdom. I believe that he came to bring the kingdom to us, to preach the kingdom, to make the kingdom a reality in our lives. But in order for us to understand the kingdom of God, I believe that we have to understand the agape of God or the love of God because the love of God, the agape of God, is an absolute in a world that's hurting today. Listen to me say this. I know when I'm giving, and I know when I'm taking. I chose these words for a reason. Now listen carefully. I know and have known most of my life since I was a child. Even children know when they're giving, and children know when they're taking. How many of you know children will take? You ever watch them? They'll take it, man. If they want it, you better get out of the way because they'll take it. And I know when I'm giving and I know when I'm taking. I believe if I understand agape, and I said that agape is absolute, God's love is absolute, if I understand his love, then I understand the giving and the taking 
is something that is also one of the most absolute things in the world. God created the world and he said it was good. And you know what happened? Adam and Eve decided they were going to take something they weren't supposed to have. Giving and taking. Look at somebody and say that. Will you say giving and taking? Say it to somebody. I'm saying that because somebody besides you is asleep, and that way you can wake them up if you talk to them. Now listen to me. God gave his son to break the taking. First thing Adam did was took. That tooking is what break this world being good. And I'm choosing these words on purpose because I, I want you to see something and I want to change our thinking and I want to change our focus because so many times we get focused on what's in it for us. So many times we get focused on how's this going to benefit me. So many times we're focused on what's this going to cost me. So many times we're focused on what am I going to get out of it that we don't see the purpose of what God intended for us to do. God gave his son to break the taking and then God reconciles himself with the world by forgiving all of the takers. That's what he did. Do y'all realize forgiveness is to forgive everybody who was taking things? Radical forgiveness is what Jesus brought. So today... I've come, we're getting ready to start Bible school. We're getting ready to do something that we do every year, and, and, and I think it's exciting, and I think it's wonderful what we're doing. We try to have things for children and ministry all the time for all ages, but, you know, when I look at God and His eternal purpose, and I wonder, what is His eternal purpose, and what is it that, that, that his agape, that's absolute, that's ruling the earth, what is it that God wants to do? And I, I believe that his eternal purpose is stated very simply in the Old Testament. And when you say it's Old Testament, it says, well, what's that got to do with us today? And, and, and I, want you to, I want you to see where this thing began, but then, and then I think I can show you where it comes over into the New Testament and throughout all of Scripture but this thing of understanding God's eternal purpose began with an oath that he made to Abraham. God himself, God the Father, made an oath to Abraham. And he said to Abraham, In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Some of you are sitting there and say, well, I understand this, I know that, but listen to what he said. He said, Abraham, in you, all of the families, all of the nations, all of the nations, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Listen carefully to me. In Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 73, John the Baptist is born, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, and then in John 1, verse 73, he says, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Well, if you run reference on this, the oath that he swore to Father Abraham here in Luke, he's making a point to say, in you, all the nations, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Now listen to me say this. God's oath to Abraham became a promise to us. 
In the new covenant, when this thing comes through the cross, it's not just an oath that God made, it's a promise that he made. Because if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are under an Abrahamic covenant where everything that's in Abraham is imparted to us and it becomes a promise to us that in you, you're going to be a blesser of the families of the earth. Thank you. That's powerful. It is. Listen carefully to me. That is God's purpose in all the earth. Some of y'all looking at me like, I don't believe I know if I believe that or not. Let me make it clear to you. God's purpose is that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He made that oath, that promise, to Abraham. Now listen to me. Help me, Lord. The essence of the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy, that's on the inside of you, the kingdom of God, is that you now have the ability to bless families, to be a blessed family. Let me say this again. Our focus. I'm not talking about doctrine today. I'm talking about our focus our focus, our focus. Just say our focus. Jesus taught, here's what Jesus taught. I've preached this so many times, you all know this. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, here's what Jesus taught. Jesus taught, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that what he taught? Jesus taught, your kingdom come, your will be done. So my focus on the kingdom coming is the will of God being done. And when I focus on the will of God being done in our lives, and I begin to see that the essence of the kingdom is Father's will to be done on the earth. When I go back and I understand that God's oath to Abraham was where? Where, where? where did he make this oath? On earth or in heaven? He looked at Abraham and he says, In you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth. Everybody say of the earth. All of the families of the earth will be blessed. When Jesus finished the redemptive work, when he came in and he paid the price for sin and he was nailed to the cross and he took the sins of mankind upon himself and he was standing there or uh, hanging there on the cross, he made this statement and he said, It is finished. Do you all understand that the redemptive work at Calvary is finished? It's a done deal. It's been it's been covered up. The takers have been covered. They've been forgiven. There's something that is in place now called the love of God, the agape of God. The, the, the kingdom of God operates in this love that, that, that has more power than you could ever imagine, more power than you could ever understand. It's a finished work. Now, is everybody with me? Everybody okay? It's 1025. Got plenty of time. I'm going to get you out of here by 11, okay? P.M. Did y'all catch that? I said 11 p.m. I'll get you out of here tonight, okay? Now watch. Let me ask this question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This may shock some of you. 
But Christ is not his last name. Just like I'm Stuart Farley, he's not Jesus Christ. Christ is who Jesus is. Christ is who Jesus is. Christ is incarnate in Jesus. He is Christ Jesus. However you want to say it. Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Jesus is how Christ enters into time. Christ is born in Bethlehem in a boy, in a child whose name was Jesus. And Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, lived 33 years. We understand, and, and, and many of us don't. Uh, make the distinction. We don't, we don't see, but today I want to do this because I, I, I want to say this in a way. When I say that Jesus is how Christ entered time, there came a time when God wanted to reveal Christ to the world and He packaged Him in Jesus. And Christ, in my mind, is about to unpack some things uh, uh, that, that, we, that He has been unfolding for years. You know, there came a time when all of a sudden God decided that he was going to bring Jesus into the earth and Jesus was born. We know the story and we've read the story and we hear the story, but do you realize that there was more to the story than just a boy being born who was a Jew in the city of, of uh, uh, Bethlehem? He was actually raised in Nazareth and, and this, this boy, this, this, this child that was Christ Jesus, he came into the earth and all of a sudden something began to unveil, something began to happen. And when this Christ Jesus was born, let me show you here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now. Let me ask you all, do you all know what now means? Huh? Does now mean when we get to heaven? What does now mean? Okay. Yet now, watch this. We know him thus no longer. Y'all know who wrote Corinthians? The Apostle Paul. Now watch. Just leave that up there for a moment. Well, you can take it down, but I'm, I want you to put maybe I want you to put that back up here in just a minute, Jeff. Just but just think about this for a moment. Paul is not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The Apostle Paul never met Jesus in the flesh that we know of. Yet, this Apostle, this man... Saul, who became Paul, starts talking about a Christ, and he makes this statement. He says, we don't know him after the flesh. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I, I, just, I just want to make sure you all are on the same page with me. Do you all understand there is a difference between the historical Jesus who was born and who grew up, and the anointed one, the Christ, who was resurrected from the dead. Y'all understand, there's a difference. And, and Paul comes on the scene, 
And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these 12 disciples who were with Paul, they knew Paul in a historical context. Oh yeah, I knew him. When he went to Bethlehem, you, you, you would talk to people, or, or Nazareth, they'd talk to people, you know, he couldn't do mighty works in Nazareth because they thought, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's Joseph and Mary's little boy. He, we, we know him. He, he's, he's got a brothers and sisters. We, we know him. And many of us here, we know about the birth of Jesus. We know historically that on Easter he arose from the dead, he got up out of the grave, and we know a historical Jesus, we know the history of what he did, we understand a little bit about the history of Jesus, but this guy by the name of Paul knew this Jesus, he met him on the Damascus Road, he realized that the guy he was persecuting, that he needed to have an encounter with him, and he realized that when he... met this, I don't know where to call him, a universal Jesus, a cosmic Jesus. There's so many things that I could say, and I'm not trying to use terminology because we get hung up on terms. You say something, say, so, oh, that's New Age stuff. No, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to say something to get you out of just knowing the historical Jesus. Help me. Paul sees something about the purpose of God, the agape of God, the kingdom of God, the love of God. Paul says there comes a place, and he's saying here, therefore, put that back up if you would, Jeff, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now... We know him thus no longer. Jesus Christ is the true human son. He is the pattern son. Now watch this. Jesus comes to John the Baptist and he says to John, I want you to baptize me. John is struggling with it. John doesn't want to do it. He goes, no, no. You ought to be baptizing me. John knew who he was. Well, the reason Jesus wanted to be baptized is he wanted to become and he wanted us to understand this new man that he was going to become. He wanted him to understand this cosmic Christ, this universal Christ, this resurrected Christ, if I could say it, is is very similar in what he does to our own baptism and what we do when you and I are baptized. God is not trying to restore us to who the original natural Adam was. He's not trying to take us back into being everything that Adam, as brilliant and as great as Adam was, that's not what God's trying to do with us. He's not trying to restore us to a natural Adam. He's trying to restore us to something which is eternal, something that has overcome death, hell, and the grave. Pastor, how do you know that? Because he said he wanted to create one new man. One new man. And in that one new man... He wants to bless all the families of the earth. But the problem is, God's family don't know they're blessed. God's children don't recognize and realize our Heavenly Father wants us to be blessed. Help me. 
Out of Jesus came one new man. Can you listen for just a minute? He's not a Jew, this new man. He's not a Gentile. No. This new man, let me just say, you do understand, God is not closer to a Jew convert than he is a Gentile convert. He loves both of them one and the same. Do you understand that? Listen, listen to me. We're not Jew. We're not Gentile. We're not rich. We're not poor. We're not bond. Not free. Not male. Not female. One new man. We're all one in Christ. And his intent is to bring freedom to all of creation. Taking, taking, taking what God didn't intend man to have put man under curse. Jesus came to give life and give it more abundantly. If you will read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will read about the historical Christ Jesus. But when you come to John, John begins his book very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They talk about the historical Jesus, but when you get into the book of John, John comes along and John begins to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John begins to take a look at this thing, and he sees the eternal Word. Then Peter comes along, and he sees this Jesus, and he's talking to this Jesus, and Jesus asked the disciples, who do they say that I am? And, and, and some of them started saying this, and some of them started saying uh, uh, somebody that was historical, and, and some other thing, that you're this prophet, that you're that. And, and, and then he looked at them and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If I'm not looking after the flesh, but after the Spirit, I can look at you and say, you are Christ, the Son of the living God, because Christ Jesus lives inside of you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you. I can go to every one of you and say, Christ Jesus lives in you. Oh, Pastor Farley, I'm just me. No, you're not. Pastor, how do you know that? Peter. Peter is talking about being born again. When you're born again, it's something that happens inside of you. Christ is born again on the inside of you. You can now, he says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. If you're not born again, you don't understand what the kingdom is. You don't understand the agape of God. You don't understand the love of God. You don't understand what Christ is. You don't understand what Christ is doing in your heart. You see the kingdom of God. You see the power of the Holy Spirit. You begin to see something that is greater and bigger than anything you could ever imagine. And you can be transformed by the power of God and transformed by the infilling of the Holy Spirit where you can see spiritually, where you can hear spiritually, and where you can know spiritually. Look at somebody and say, you're a new man.
And by the way, for all you people who are politically correct, womb man is still a man. Not in the sense you're wanting to say it. I'm saying, do you all understand man and woman? All right. I ain't trying to be mean. Well, that's funny. I'll tell you what. You shouldn't say that. You ought to say men and women. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Help me, Lord. Let me give you a couple of numbers. This Abraham that I'm talking about that God made an oath to. When God made an oath to Abraham, I believe God has to keep the oath that he made to Abraham. Let me tell you something. Abraham is used 64 times in the New Testament. 64 times. That astounded me. Abraham is used in the New Testament. Promise is used 44 times. I believe what God is asking us to do is will you work with me in fulfilling the oath, the promise that I made to Abraham? Will you assist me as my body, as my family, as one new man with me in fulfilling my oath to Abraham? Pastor, What is that? Don't you all think that the Holy Spirit wants to enable us, anoint us, empower us, work in us in such a way that He, the Holy Spirit, will help us to participate with Christ in the kingdom purpose and what is that purpose of the kingdom? And the purpose of the kingdom is that all the families of the earth will be blessed. If the purpose of God is on the earth, and if the will of God is on the earth, then we've got to focus. Everybody say focus. We've got to focus that God is at work in our lives and what He wants us to focus on and what He wants us to do is to bless all the families of the earth. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, Luke 22, verse 28. He says, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me. Now guys, listen to me say this. Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples, and he's saying to his 12 disciples, I'm bestowing a kingdom upon you, just like my Father bestowed upon me. And then John comes along and he opens up something brand new in John 1, verse 12. It says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe on his name. If I could say it to you this way, here's how I would say it. I believe the reason that we have access to Jesus and when we go to Jesus 
Jesus is who gives us access to the Father. And when we go to the Father, I believe the Father is trying to get across to us and the Father is trying to say to us, I want you to join me in blessing all the families of the earth. Let me ask you a question. In the last 100 years, what has been Satan's number one attack on planet earth families he is doing everything in his power to destroy to divide to upset to tear down families You remember when Jesus came, Jesus picked up the oath and he began to, 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 to discover that the Father had made an oath. And Jesus said, I didn't come here to this earth to do my own will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. I came to do my Father's will. And the new birth is about us being awakened to what the Father is doing and, 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 and seeing what God's trying to do, do about, but we've missed the focus of the kingdom to the point, you know, that, that Christianity, I'm not sure, we have made Christianity pretty selfish. We've made it all about what do I have to do for me? What is it about for me? How can I be blessed? How can I get to heaven? What can I do for me? We've, we've so misunderstood what the kingdom of God is about. We've so misunderstood what God came. We, we're, we're just trying to see what's in it for me. We've presented a gospel that says, you know, this is, this is, this, this is what, 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 what we should be doing. So we've missed the focus of the kingdom. What is his focus? His focus is all the families of the earth will be blessed. I believe he makes families the center of his purpose. My prayer this week is that God will empower some children two years of age to the fifth grade with power from on high. You give me a couple more minutes. Let me run through a little bit of scripture with you. I'll have you out of here by 11 today. Jesus asked his disciples, do y'all, y'all know where I'm going? They didn't have a clue where he was going. Look, look with me in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 14. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For Listen, listen to what he says. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I came from and where I'm going. Look at verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Listen to me. Where I go, you cannot come. Then he says again in verse 22. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go? You cannot come where I go. You cannot come. Let me ask you. I think the disciples are saying, why can't we go with you? Where are you going, Jesus? Then over in John chapter 13, John 13, verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer you will seek me, and I said, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. Does everybody here understand the Jewish Jesus right here, where I'm going, you can't come. The Jewish Jesus is about to become the cosmic resurrected Christ. I'm going somewhere. You remember he looked at his disciples. He said, expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. I'm going somewhere. And then he looks at his disciples and he says, I want you to go and I want you to tarry 
in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high because my Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the Christ that is in me is going to come and participate and fill you and you need to stay there where I'm going. You can't go, but I've got a place for you to go and I've got something I want to do inside of you. And the kingdom of God was about to break on the earth when he began to fill every one of the believers. Then over in John chapter 14, verse 4, it says, And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. You know. Then in verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, agape incarnate, that's truth, and the life, zoe, life which is eternal. And then in John chapter 16, Verse 5, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? Do you know what God's offering us? His kingdom. He's offering us his kingdom. And he teaches throughout his word, if you see the kingdom, you ought to sell everything you've got to buy it because it's far more precious, far more worthy than anything you'll ever have. If you ever have a kingdom offer, sell it. Buy the field. Get it. Don't miss it. Jesus, Take me to the Father. I'll go with you to the Father. Father, what do you want me to do? I want you to help me bless every family on the earth. Listen to me. Rama Christian Center has been blessed. And because we are blessed, we have the power and the right and the will to be a blessing. I get so upset at people who want to talk about how they're blessed and they put themselves on a pedestal like, don't you wish you were as blessed as me? I'm so spiritual, I'm so holy, I'm so righteous, I got it together. You all could be like me one day. prayed for apartments beside us yesterday like I've never prayed in all of the days they've been in existence here. I walked around up there and if I heard kids inside, I knocked on the door. We have an opportunity to bless the families of the world and participate with God in changing nations. And it begins by impacting another generation. Sam, you don't know the kids you may impact. Mary Beth, you don't understand what a blessing you have the ability to be and do. I can go around this room some of you have heard me tell the story I was coming back from Huntington one day and there used to be a service station at the exit just past the second toll booth I can't even remember what the exit is right now if you got off that exit and you turned right you'd go up there just a few hundred yards or so and there was an Exxon station there on the right and one day that was about my normal bathroom stop from Huntington. And I went in there, go to the bathroom. Of course, if you go in to use the bathroom, you don't buy gas, you have to buy something to drink so that you don't feel like you're taking. Buy a drink, and I walk up to the cash register, and a little girl looks at me, and she goes, you're Pastor Farley, aren't you? I said, I am, yes, ma'am. 
She says, you don't remember me, do you? She said, have you got a minute? And I said, sure. So she went over to the phone and she made a phone call and said, get down here right now. She said, I was at Davis Stewart and we got to come to your church and you baptized me that time, I think she said, 10 years ago. Do you remember? I said, honey, I'm sorry. What's your name? And I, I tried every way in the world I could to make her feel good. You understand what I'm saying? But I, I didn't remember her, don't remember seeing her. In just a few minutes, here come a man with a little girl, about two years old. She come walking there and she goes, this is my husband. And I introduced her, she said, this is my little girl. She said, I'd like for you to just hold her a minute and pray for her. I walked out of that there, there that day. And I said, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for using me to help somebody. Today I'm looking at you and I'm saying to you, God will use you to bless the families of the earth. Will you participate with him and get off your fanny and quit living your life for yourself? I don't care if it's writing something. I don't care if it's encouraging someone. I don't care if it's giving someone something. I was somewhere the other day and reached in my pocket and gave two little kids a dollar a piece. And you know, and today you never know when a kid's going to look at you and say, is that all you got or what? You never know how they're going to react to a buck. But that was all I had. Didn't have any, well, I, I did have a couple of bigger bills, but I wasn't that generous that day. And that little girl looked, Mommy, Mommy, that guy gave me a dollar. Let's go to the store. She grabbed my leg, and she almost hurt my leg. She squeezed it so hard. You are to bless the families of the earth. Will you join together with me and pray that this week's vacation Bible school be something? We've been joking in class about cookies and Kool-Aid and Bible school. I won't embarrass anybody. But somebody impacted your life somewhere. And you can be a blessing. Stand with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wonderful people that have heard this sermon today. I thank you, Lord, for the choices you've made to allow us to join with you in blessing the nations of the earth. Help us to focus today on how to be a blessing. How can we bless our children? How can we bless our world? How can we bless our nation? How can we bless the families of this earth? Give us the wisdom, the insight, and the power now. In Jesus' name, amen.